such as the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, and the cover-up of a secret chamber beneath the Romanian Sphinx. His name is Peter Moon, publisher and author of many books, but probably best known for a trilogy, disclosing the details of the legendary secret government program known as the Montauk Project, co-authored by the original Montauk Project whistleblower Preston Nichols, as well as a more recent series revealing information about the strange contents of a secret chamber underground in Romania which he co-authored with Radu Sinemar, who is a member of the Romanian Intelligence Services Occult Department and, again, an original source for a fascinating story. I'm for sure super excited. So let's get to it. Peter, my man, how's it going? I'm good, thanks. It's nice to be here. Absolutely, man. Thanks for being here. Uh, you have such a history with two of the wildest stories out there, and I really want to let those be our two main subjects for the show. Let's start with the Montauk Project, one of several supposed secret government programs experimenting with time travel as well as other weird stuff. And this thread of info about time travel experiments, it really seems to start with the Philadelphia Experiment, another conspiracy staple that has many different versions and speculations. But I know that you've looked into it and spoken about it quite a bit, so maybe we should start there. What would you consider the Philadelphia Experiment? Was that one of the first known in instances of such a project? And what happened there? Whether or not it's, a, it's, it's the first, uh, it's hard to say it's the first, but it's certainly one of the most uh, spectacular. You know, like yeah. if, if a patient had a stroke, did he have many strokes before that? Uh, or many strokes, many strokes, but, but this was like a major... Uh, gyration <laughs> of the earth and it's very important that it occurred uh, according to the lore uh, in August of 1943 because there is a biorhythm which coincides with the so-called birthday of Isis when the star Sirius is most direct it's, it was the, the high holy days of ancient Egypt and, and this period of August is when, when the star system Sirius is, is right there, closest to us, is, is a very sacred day really? in many different traditions. Now, this is when it occurred. So it's called a biorhythm that occurs uh, every year, but there's a major biorhythm every 20 years. Now, this, this is a gyration of the Earth. So uh, not an earthquake, but sort of like an earthquake in some respects. Mm -hmm. It's like the meridian, like the, the, the meridian system of the human body moves from one channel to the next, the heart feeds the liver, or the liver feeds the heart, etc. So you have this cycles of energy moving through the earth, and this was a big one. So that's sort of an esoteric behind the scenes explanation of what was going on on a purely energetic basis. When we translate energy into the human condition and the human drama, where every person is a player on the stage, we have government. Uh, different governments, the German government mm -hmm. the, having a hand in it, the American government and the British would have been in there with all their secret departments, which are being directed. Uh, people don't, when they look at world politics, they like, well, you know, obviously people will look at Obama and, and the heads of state, and then if they think they're going to get a little bit deeper, they'll go to build the Bilderbergers and the Bohemian Grove right. and all sort of things. Um, but as I began to investigate this, I had synchronicities with occult phenomena, and you had uh, occultists, uh, Alistair Crowley being one of them, who, who turned up, but he said something very interesting. <clears throat> there are... Uh, according to him, you have this, this MJ-12 stuff that everybody's pretty much heard yeah. of. What, what that is really an offshoot of is what they call the secret chiefs. Those, those MJ-12 people were, uh, they, you know, they're, they're puppets just as much as they were players. They were at important positions. But the, the, the real, the secret chiefs, the mm -hmm. secret chiefs, they're called in occultism, and these are invisible characters. You're not going to get too much of a a glimpse of. Of course. And, and yes. So this is this is what we're dealing on the world stage of the Philadelphia experiment, where you have experimentation with radar, experimentation with degaussing a ship so that it does not appear uh, on radar screens, mm -hmm. changing the electromagnetic field, and that's what the Philadelphia experiment was on the surface. And then, according to the, the lore of what happened, it disappeared. It disappeared and left this dimension. 
And the most important, I guess, evidence that they had was the, the damage that it did to the crew. And the crew was compromised uh, mentally, physically, sometimes catching on fire and what we know now as spontaneous combustion, yeah. or what's termed as that, sometimes having their body parts amalgamated into the bulkhead of the ship uh, and just suffering. Sometimes it was just mental trauma. These these people were brought to various, about three naval hospitals, one of them, or military hospitals, one of which was in Camp Upton, Long Island, which was a convalescent hospital during World War One, And it it was right adjacent to the old Nazi compound, compounding the complexity of the ju- secret German involvement with the Philadelphia Experiment, uh, which is in a book called The Philadelphia Experiment Murder that I published. But the so you have this is you have a confluence of different events on a bigger global scale, and then the conspiracy of, of the government files and what happens is all gets kind of shredded and all kind of disappears, but what you have is the acting out of, on a lower level, some, you know, bizarre play where everything's secret, but you do have experiments going on behind the scenes that are experimenting with human beings. Um, this is in a time when, you know, we didn't have the abduction stories that, that are so prevalent today. Right. You had, uh, this would be the precursor to that, um, because if any abductions that were going on back then, whether they were being done by organized crime or by military or secret government stuff, if, if they seem to be very reduced in number to the reports we get today. So the reports were fewer. Uh, it would seem that there was relatively little going on compared to today. So you have this going on uh, not so much in 43, but you have a study of these people who went into other dimensions and suffered greatly, and this becomes a great human factor study, which uh, takes place after the war in combination with the data that they studied from Joseph Mengele, who did all sorts of horrible experiments on human beings, including uh, little people, sometimes known as dwarves or midgets, uh, doing experiments on twins, yeah. uh, the psychic energy of twins, and all of this evolved into the human factor study at the at the old Camp Upton Convalescent Hospital, which turned into Brookhaven National Laboratory. It was the top security site uh, in the East Coast, if not the nation. It was the headquarters of where atomic energy was being studied. It was owned by Associated Universities, which was a quasi-government group, not actually a government group. So it it was a very interesting uh, confluence of events, and out of this human factor study at Brookhaven get the Montauk project. But that early human factor study was engineered by John von Neumann. Mm -hmm. And he was the engineer of the Philadelphia experiment who was also applying his studies of the human mind. Well, of what you call uh, electronics and computing to the human mind. He invented the first modern computer. And that was being used to study the human mind and get inputs and outputs on a computer. Right on. This type of experimentation has been verified. In fact, it's rather mundane. You'll even see certain aspects of it on the PBS sometimes, where you'll see fighter flight simulation and even stealth craft pilots where they can actually move the ship by thinking, by yeah. manipulation. So this is, was the early parts of the studies and as they went forward it, it, they established the control of the human mind through uh, through electronics and this scared the Congress which outlawed it you're not going to see this in the congressional record of course but you it then went underground and ended up at Montauk Point New York in in or about 1972 where it really started going and Montauk Point New York had an old Air Force station uh, Camp Hero, it's called. Its military history goes back to World War One as Camp Wyckoff. But but Camp Hero uh, has had a lot of strange things associated with it uh, forever and a day. It's a strange place, yeah. and it's not necessarily a safe place. But uh, it's now a, a state park where you can go out and visit it. You couldn't when we began investigating it. We uh, 
uh, turned the uh, apple cart upside down here when we actually had uh, a trial in uh, the town of East Hampton. It was not me, but Preston Nichols, Duncan Cameron, and another man, Mark, who got involved in a, uh, a trial because they were ticketed on this ground, and they'd chase you off virulently. In other words, mm-hmm. vehemently, even uh, violently, they would chase you off of that ground. Why? It was a state park, but they were right, using right. it for something. So there was a trial, which Preston Nichols <laughs> was serving as his own defense uh, attorney, and he actually won. It was pretty funny. Really? I have a transcript of the t- trial somewhere. Yes, because the judge actually said to the radar operator, or that he was a radar operator, actually he was park police, you know, he said, why can't these people go? This is a state park. You're supposed to have one-third of it dedicated uh, at least two-thirds of it dedicated to the people. They had confiscated much more. Why can't people go on there? He says, I walk my dog there. So the judge actually uh, ruled justly, which is sometimes novel <laughs> in our culture, but he ruled yeah, justly. Yeah. Uh, and it caused a precedent where Bernadette Castro, who was at that time the Parks Commissioner, uh, actually purchased a copy of... Uh, one of the videos that Preston Nichols sold through Sky Books, and I actually sent her a uh, a tape. I sent her a tape which showed all this chicanery going on, and she got super fun money to clean up, allegedly clean up the camp. I'm not saying she was there was nothing wrong with what she did, but she yeah. uh, they had this very strange company, the Parsons Corporation, come out from. Their headquarters were in Pasadena. They came out and did a whole cleanup study of munitions and whatnot with the the gov- what was it the army the Army Corps of Engineers and that was a whole fiasco. They tried to hide a public meeting, which I was able to attend, and it, it, this army guy was lying his pants off. And and uh, but anyway, it was uh, you know so anybody can go out there now. Right so th- this is uh, and, but of course they were doing experiments with the mind with. Eventually, they were manifesting objects, according to the stories, uh, manifesting objects, because if you can manifest, affect thoughts, like there are reports of them changing the mood of people, animals. Mm -hmm. We've got some video that shows strange animal behavior out there. I even saw an abducted deer, or not an abducted, what do they call it, mutilated deer out there, which was a classic mutilation of a deer that looked like it had been dumped from outer space. Or no, not, I shouldn't say outer space. I should say, you know, from a hundred yards, you know, a mile up, it just went splat on the ground. Uh, so yeah. they were doing strange things with, you know, parts taken out of it. I've heard some really bold claims. I mean, when our government has so much secrecy, it really does leave the door open for some of these things that could be possible. What happened with the Montauk chair? Because that's kind of what this uh, conspiracy kind of surrounds is this Montauk chair. Does it come from? Uh, a, UF, a crashed UFO? No, the, the Montauk chair is, a, you know, the information we have out, have about it is somewhat abstract, particularly the procuring of it. Like I, I knew the man who claimed to have procured it and how he came into my life was very bizarre. And, and But, you know, there, there's tangential ties to that he worked. He used to operate a portfolio. His name was George Dixon. He's passed away last summer. I wouldn't even mention it. And he... He never wanted this broadcast publicly, but I met him, and when Duncan and Preston heard the story about that I told them about it, they were shocked, not because they hadn't heard of it, but that he'd ever told anybody. He was always very secret. It was just between the three of them, and he told me because I was putting the book together, and he wanted me to know it, and he had strange financial connections, and you know, he was a very unusual guy, uh, and so... There was a lot of strange tentacles of people that I met behind the scenes, but the Montauk chair was basically a lounge chair uh, that had crystal radio receivers put around it so that it could pick up the thoughts of a psychic and be amplified out the gain horde of the, the transmitter tower out there. Preston Nichols can give you a much better technical description of it than I can because he's expert in this stuff. But basically, it's like it's a it's an amplifier. You know how if somebody's playing a guitar, an electric guitar, and they put an amplifier and it amplifies yeah. the sound. Well, 
the sound is is basically radio waves. So mm-hmm. you know you're doing the same thing with the mental waves, and you're amplifying what's going out in the mind, which includes emotions and includes modes. Uh, there was a man, the, George used to give me this paper on Martin Cannon, who did a whole lot of research on being able to change the moods of people. It was all sort of documented uh, studies by Martin Cannon. And this stuff is kind of pedestrian nowadays. At the time it was coming up in the 90s, when when this was printed, it was very controversial. Right. Uh, mind control has been, it's it's not featured too often, on TV, but it's mentioned now and then they've had shows on it. And it's certainly a staple of conspiracy lore and a, and a staple of history. There's even been, what was it? The, the CIA uh, made a settlement with people at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal who had claims of uh, mind control being used against them by Duncan Ewan Cameron, who was uh, connected to Duncan Cameron of the, the Montauk project. But, but this guy was, was uh you know, evil personified with what he did. The CIA did not admit any wrongdoings in the payouts. It was all done in Canada, where the CIA was not supposedly involved uh, because yeah. it's Canadian. So you get out of it by going to Canada and doing it. But this stuff is pedestrian now. The, the mind control stuff that happened and surrounded the Montauk Project doesn't really have to be established as a. We don't have to argue about the fact that mind control is a whole <laughs> sub sub. Agreed. Subject, subsubject of this now. Where it becomes very interesting is the components of time travel, the technology of time yes. travel, and how mind control surrounds that. Because we live in a society where we are limited. We are limited in the way we think, the way we act. Uh, we don't eat proper food. Uh, there is not an adequate demand for proper food, although there is a demand that's increasing. But even that response is, you know, you go into New York City where I'll be in a couple of days and you see the, they call it organic food. They don't know what they're talking about in New York City. <laughs> it, it, some places might, but by and large, no. People want to eat organic, so they'll they'll have juices, and, and they don't really understand. In Long Island, it's better, but uh, it's still, there's a long way to go as far as teaching people how to eat properly. Uh so that their brains will think properly and they will yeah. function properly. And th- this is a whole story that one can go into the uh, holistic quality of a human being. And uh, there are a lot of lacks in, in the society we live in. So, True. We're, yes, so we're, we're so when you talk about the subject of time, well, time is a perception. And how do people perceive? They perceive with their their brain. And it's a filter, and the brain is not even fully activated. It's partially activated. So this gets really down to more of the conspiracy is the human construct as opposed to uh, shape-shifting reptilians, Bilderbergers, uh, international bankers, and this sort of thing. And and they they don't help the problem, but the real conspiracy, and this is what I started off into as a young person, was the conspiracy of your own circumstance, of your own awareness. This is the key focal point because conspiracy focuses too much on look what they're doing. Look at the power of the dollar bill and the eye in the triangle in the dollar right. bill and this stuff that is really silly and has been over marketed on That's the prison on the history channel. Exactly. And that whole concept of the eye in the triangle that they show on the dollar bill that is the symbol of the Illuminati. That is the symbol of the illuminated, illuminated being within yourself that you want, that the mystery schools used to teach that gets convoluted and degraded over the centuries. So that eye in the triangle is what you want to wake up in yourself. And, and as you do wake up, uh, you will see uh, the conspiracy that's going around you just in terms of the way people eat, conduct themselves in business and this sort of thing. So this is what... You, You know, rather than focusing on all these nefarious acts that these people do and how they make this Batman shooting and what's that thing, the Sandy Hook shooting and how it's all tied together and people are studying how it's all tied together. Yes, it's all tied together. And when you're studying how it's all tied together, you're kind of missing what's going on inside of you. Yeah, you're still kind of within the framework of the matrix. Yeah, yeah, you're in the squirrel cage and Yes, it's all connected. It was always connected. You're just becoming aware of it. 
it's better to become aware of what's going on with you and you could be improving yourself um, as opposed to unveiling this conspiracy, which has been, I said, when they start unveiling it on the History Channel or the Jesse Ventura show or whatever, this is like the shoemaker uh, or the, sh- what is it? The shoeshine boy telling you to buy stocks. It's time to get <laughs> the stock market. It's, it's time to get out of conspiracy because yes. uh, it's, it's really, we've got everybody doing it. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, sure. It's getting saturated. I, I, a lot of, a lot of areas are getting saturated. Conspiracy shows because, uh, you know, it helps me sell my books. Okay. That's how I make my living. But uh, on the other hand, it's, it's also important to, you know, speak the truth and say, what is what about what? And, and this is sort of the situation. And, and there's a lot of people that, you know, need to be more aware of what goes on that still believe in, in the goodness of, you know, what our government supposedly stands for, as opposed to what it really stands for. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, people are waking up on different levels. So right. but this, this is, you know, the, the current level in my estimation is to, you know, shed the conspiracy shackles and start working on yourself. That's, you know, I've had a lot of guests recently that have kind of put that out there. And we try to cover a lot more of the positive side than a lot of other shows. I know Alex Jones, one of the most popular shows out there, it's always just, uh, it's just identifying little pieces within the framework and it doesn't really ever get you out of it. There's not very much enlightening talk there. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It is important. To identify it and to know what happened, but also, you know, you gotta you gotta realize, you know, you're not gonna fight this battle in the three dimensional world. It's a mental thing, and if you can free your mind, um, that's about as good as you can do. I can't speak for Alex Jones. I've certainly heard of him. I've seen a few YouTube's. I've never listened to his show, but then I've never listened to the uh, Art Bell show. Uh, maybe I heard the David Anderson uh, broadcast. I, I looked those on YouTube, but I've never listened to any of these shows. George Nori. Uh, really? No, no, never listen to them because they're not a valid source of information for what I would be interested in. But uh, Well, let's talk about that. What are you interested in? What message would you put out that you don't think people say, are hearing let, enough? Let's say something about, about the uh, – is it's not even about Alex Jones. Somebody did a whole a diatribe on where his funding comes from. Right. But not in relation to Alex Jones, but it's the uh, – Somebody also did a study of the ratings of these big conservative talk show hosts like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and and some others. I think it was that guy, that uh, Mormon guy. He was really noisy on TV. He was a short guy with the blonde hair. Huh. Uh, I, that Glenn Beck. Yeah, yeah, Glenn Beck. And somebody did a study and said that their ratings were completely bogus and false. In other words, yes. people not listening to their shows and that – Whatever the company, I forget the name, which was the biggest broadcasting company, was paying them huge salaries, but it was all false ratings because they're thinking that they broadcast that out there and people think that this is what people are thinking or thinking that they're agreeing. Now, sure, that does, there are some people agreeing with it and buying into it, but it's all sort of a scam in itself because the ratings aren't there, but they right. pay these guys huge money so they can play the part. But it's it's actually a controlling of the airways because nobody really wants to hear this bogus conservatism, which isn't really conservative at all. And so so this is like what goes on in media. And does it go on in uh, the alternative uh, media? Yes, it, it's even probably more sinister there because people are being more fooled. And most of your top line speakers have affiliations with secret societies. Yes, that's true. Uh, and it's it's like uh, they, they just don't understand. So I, you're saying, what am I interested in? It's generally not what other people are interested in. I was interested in time at a time when physicists weren't interested in time. They were interested in holding their status quo with a few, few tiny exceptions. Uh so now all the physicists are getting interested in time and, and it's become vogue to talk about the possibility of time travel, although most of them are really in the dark ages. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. So th- this is like, what am I interested in? What human beings are interested in uh, 
I mean, you look at what they watch on TV and whatnot. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like peeling back the veil. Right now, right. my main interest is is in the, the Romanian uh, adventure that I'm in involved in, of as course. well as as well as Qigong, uh, Taoist Qigong, which I practice every day, um, which is is all about energy. Well, you started off kind of by mentioning that biorhythm um, that took place right around the time of the Philadelphia experiment. I wondered if maybe that had anything to do with uh, creating a different effect when they're manipulating magnetic fields. I mean, you hear about ley lines, you hear about certain energy nodes on the planet. Energy is the one area that I just, it starts to get a little new agey. I haven't felt any real effects of energy in my life. I've gone to Reiki before and had no little no, no effect. I'm interested in it. How could someone who's a bit of a skeptic actually feel a noticeable energy change? Is there a way just to verify? Yes, I can tell you right now. Nice. I can tell you, uh, if you were to take your hand and you were to, to press uh, at the bottom of each finger, you know, where the, where the, where the finger meets the, the part of the hand, uh -huh. you, you press each one of those bottom points of the finger and on each hand. You, you press them and you rub them around for a bit. And then you rub the center, uh, the center of the palm. And then if you've done that, tell me when you've done that on both hands. Oh, I'm doing it. Okay. Now, you take your fingernails and you rub the fingernails together like you were, uh, like they were sandpaper. You know, like you were rubbing sandpaper against, you were okay. like selling your nails, each one. You're rubbing all your fingernails together in the thumbs. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. And the audience can do this. And you do this for a while. Now, when, when you do this and you keep doing it, I'm going to have you open up your hands and you're going to feel an imaginary ball, which will be about the size of a Nerf ball. If you just open it up now, open up the hand. You feel the energy between your hands? I do. I definitely do feel like a little tingle there. Yeah. Yeah. You'll feel an energy. That's a chi ball. Chi is life force energy. Now, you can take this and... You just feel that energy. You can send that to any part of your body. I, I, I once did this for an audience in Germany, and and the woman had had a hip plane. Her whole, whole you know, for a what do you call it a acute hip pain, and she did this exercise. I said send it to her body, and she was so happy. She was healed. She came up and gave me all these massage tools that she used in her profession. These wow. you know about sixty dollars worth of massage tools as a gift for me because she was so. You know, I said, wow, this handled a long duration affliction that she'd had. Now, where I could show you more proof, and I, I wouldn't brag about my own abilities cause simply because I haven't tried it, but there is something called a Kangen water system that, that can cost up to $10,000 that is increases the pH of the water. And, of course, pH is very good for uh, to have high pH in your water because it will alkalize your body, and diseases only happen when your body is... I've heard that there's a cancer cure that revolves around that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. So anyway, there was a big martial arts uh, you know, seminar going down in North Carolina, and my teacher was down there. And this guy who was leading the seminar had a Kangen water system and was showing how the pH could down. My teacher went over there using this type of energy, which that's – there's much more. That's just like an initial introduction to a chi ball. But he goes over there, puts his hands around the water, and it had a higher pH than the, the, the than the Kangen water system. That's physical chi energy from a from a qigong grandmaster. Yeah, I've seen some monks do some crazy things. Bruce Lee was all about the chi energy, and he had powers that seemed to transcend, you know, what's normal. His strength seemed to be ridiculously powerful, and uh, I've seen plenty of examples of it. It's it just seems like uh, it takes so much time and years and years of dedication to. Well, it, 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 let me let me put it this way: I've been studying it uh, for six years, and uh, according to to what my teacher told me, see, because a lot of guys, if you listen to Chuck Norris talking about the death of Rose Lee, he doesn't know what he's talking about because he's not really. He'll talk about the medical reasons Bruce died, uh, and he's not really genned in on this sort of martial arts. He's in this sort of kick-ass karate. <laughs> Yeah, uh, learn in Korea, and uh, there's a he, lot of mystery surrounding Bruce Lee's yes, death. A lot of yes, conspiracy. I'm just telling you what my teacher told me. Sure. Basically, Bruce Lee was he was a great, great athlete, great martial artist, but he was at odds with the Chinese. They didn't want him to teach this, of mm -hmm. course, or this story. 
But he was also very cocky and disrespectful at times. You know, he, he preached the Tao. Yes. And he, he was, it was very close to his heart. And he was disrespectful. And from the story I heard, which is like inside martial arts, he disrespected one of these masters. You know, and, and when I say disrespected him, probably uh, tweaked him physically. I don't know what happened. But one of his students was 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 not very happy and hit Bruce Lee in the back of the head and actually hit him. Now, this hit was not something that, you know, paralyzed Bruce Lee. It was a chi blow. Chi can be used to kill. It can be used. It's all about intent. Mm -hmm. And this this was like was a reaction. I don't know exactly what happened. But that chi knocking into Bruce Lee's head is what precipitated the whole medical situation. In other words, he was he was dead from chi. And wow. his chi, you know, you don't die like that if your if your chi is working. You know, it's even with the synchronicity of the moment. He got he bit off more than he could chew. Gotcha. He's also got a curse against him, his family supposedly. But yeah. anyway, this chi blow, he was told what to do and to come back and get it healed. And he did not come. He did not pay attention. He did not, you know, so as, as great as he was, as brilliant as he was, we all have our weak points. He was prideful. Yeah. yeah, prideful. And that's, and you know, he was good. He would, he would not teach pride, but I mean, the guy was good. When you're that good, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's it's not hard. It's right. especially if you're a showman and an actor. Yeah, it's, you're among the masses who have well, no show, clue. You're showing. You're basically showing off. That's and, true. And and he was a, a great. And I, from you know, he was basically a great human being from everything I've heard about him. But as they say, when you get into some of these loftier areas of what you're doing, uh, you know, that's the story I know. I wasn't there. But when I do see his wife talking about it or this or that or the other thing, there's some blank spots there that, that, that certain things they don't understand because they don't even talk in terms of chi energy or really understanding what it is. It's very powerful. Um, and, of course, in, in, in the hands of a master, it's, it's, it's life-giving. It's, uh, and that's really the point of it is to, to teach people life. But it's so outside of the box of the way people think that mm -hmm. some uh, I saw a jujitsu master last night kind of really having some ontological shock about being shown certain things that just seemed so stupid to him. But not that he was saying they were stupid, but it's like, you know, there, you know, he knows these moves that are like conventional karate type moves and they just aren't going to work against certain principles of nature. So it's like, and, and there was even a story that's true of, of one guy getting thrown by a woman in our class and he checked into Bellevue. He had ontological shock. He thought he went in the rubber room. He couldn't deal with it because some woman could outmaneuver him. And he was like a nth degree black belt or whatever. Damn. So, so that th this is like, it's, you know, it's, it's energy and it's people have fixed ideas. So if you have people that are like well-schooled in whether it's, you know, karate or, or something more mundane like university education, they're very entrained to think in a certain way. You know, all, all Chinese martial arts is trained in the wrong. I'm telling you it's trained in the wrong way because I was taught by somebody who teaches it the right way. Mm -hmm. And he can demonstrate why they do it the wrong way. I also sometimes uh, wonder about just the placebo effect in general and that if people have doubts, if they've been taught that there's nothing to energy, they aren't going to feel those effects because their mind is telling them there's nothing there, kind of like, same goes with crystals. You know, some people put a lot of faith in crystals and their properties, and maybe it's uh, maybe they're manifesting that because they have such faith in it. Sometimes I wonder about yes, that. With crystals, what you have to understand with crystals is that's how radios work. <laughs> radios well, that's true. Crystals. So it's kind of like they are uh, what you need a crystal to make a radio receive. So if you put it into the scientific reference frame, then you have now. I. I uh, had a uh, a friend, I don't know what happened to him, Mark Roberts, he's mentioned in my book, uh, Montauk Book of the Living. He was a dowser, a very interesting man. But he, he was doing a, a workshop here in New York, and he took these two crystals that were flat, 
they had flat. I think they've been, you know, shaved. Mm-hmm. Shaved is the word. I can't even remember. Cut. What's the word? Uh, sawed. And they were flat bottoms. And he rubbed them together in a dark room, and we saw them light up. Wow, this, that's awesome. It was a piezoelectric effect but he says i want you to see that this energy with crystals is not not bs he says he so he showed it and he wanted to demonstrate it and and it would light up uh, they were quartz crystals uh, crystals are definitely interesting but people attribute some wild properties to them and well, i'm not so sure uh how far it goes you know the spectrum is very wide with crystals yeah, yeah it is well in terms it, of the claims yeah, yes it's it's uh but you know people that are freak have uh you know sensitives they have different brain entrainment I don't mean that they're exaggerating, but they, they're sensitive. So they, there is applications to them, uh, but that's a whole other subject. Uh, yeah. Crystals. But anyway. Well, I do want to jump over to uh, your other claim to fame, man, the, the other great chunk of conspiracy goodness. I mean, that's the stuff that's going on in Romania, you know, the story of the Hall of Records. As I understand it, because of your work in describing the Montauk Project and time travel, you were approached by this David Anderson guy who was impressed enough to bring you to Romania uh, where you met this Radu Cinemar guy and he told you about the secret chamber. Are those kind of the cliff notes you want to tell people a little That's bit more of that story? It's, 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 it's not exactly accurate because, well, David is a very interesting character who I've known for some 14 years now. And he uh, – is a time control scientist who was very impressed with the Montauk project. In fact, he made a point of it. And when he read my last newsletter, I do have a newsletter, uh, the Montauk pulse, which is published once every quarter. Uh, you can get it from skybooks at, uh, skybooksusa.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. It's quarterly. It's about $20 a, a year. There's four issues. And I, I do updates on this stuff. The next one will be on my adventures to Romania, which we'll probably be touching on here in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. But David, uh, is a time control scientist, and he uh, gave a, an incredible lecture on coast to coast, not a lecture, a discussion on coast to coast about the capabilities of what he's up to now. Of course, I've kind of followed him with this for 14 years, and he can slow things down in time, speed them up in time. I saw a video at this at Montauk with about 20 other people. We witnessed a video of this. He's not been able really? to. Yeah, he's not been able to release that or a similar video due to, uh, what he calls bureaucratic uh, issues, red tape, he called it. Oh, man. He's, ho- he's hoping to do, in fact, I thought he would have done it by now from what he said, but release uh, courses in time, uh, online courses on time, studying time. Now, I don't have any idea what these courses are going to be, um, but he's supposed to be doing courses, online courses for people interested in time. On I guess it would be on his website at the Anderson Institute. But he was interested in time. He was helping uh, to fund a camp called Atlanticron in, in Romania that would meet every summer. And it was artists, writers, and scientists who would mm-hmm. meet their minds. And some really incredible things come out of there. But it's basically a camp for youth, Romanian youth, 16 to 30. They have science fiction discussions there. Uh, they have art workshops. They have scientific discussions. There's a man who brought neurology to Romania, the science of neurology. I see him every year. I'm friends with him and his wife. Uh, the Complexity Studies Center, Florin Montano, who's like one of the most incredible professors in Romania. These people have become my friends. but And, and, and many of them have met David. I got to meet the... Uh, uh, Dimitri, the, the cosmonaut, he's, he's the only Romanian ever to go in space. Romania's cosmonaut to go nice. in space. So he's now a friend of mine. And there's incredible people there. He recently just started showing up at Atlanticon. So you have an incredible amount of uh, some of the best minds in the world flow through that, uh, that camp. And, of course, they're teaching young people. I teach Qigong there, and I lecture on sort of the stuff I'm with a more of a tilt towards sacred Romania. But I lecture on all this all these type of things. And the David, so David Anderson brought me there. He was there the first two summers. And although he, he keeps tabs on me while I'm there, he has not been present for the last four summers um, at, at Romania, but he, he, you know, emails me now and then while I'm there, even in real life he does, but uh, he's not, 
we're, we're waiting for something to come from his quarter. The next thing I expect to hear is these, these online courses. But he's a real time control scientist. And when he did the interview with Art Bell, he did say, Art asked him if they were putting people in the chamber, and he says yes. And he said it was very close to before, before sending people back in time, so to speak. Now, wow. he also will tell you in the same paragraph that what you're told is, you know, the government or the secret sector is 15, 20 years ahead of you. Preston Nichols would say 30 years ahead of you. What you don't hear, like the the little tiny computers that we have today. Mm-hmm. I remember a guy connected with Bell Labs telling me that they had those in in the 1980s. He was telling me, he says, yeah, it's all, all in a little box. So these discoveries are made way ahead of time, and then they're filtered out into the military industrial complex. Mm-hmm. Who's going to sell them? Is it going to be, you know, Sony? Is it going to be Samsung? Is it going to be, you know, right, uh, whatever company? Uh, so these are, you know, the way the world really is, as opposed to the way it appears to be. But so David Anderson brought me to Romania, and he didn't. Uh, I did not meet uh, Radu Sinemar in person. I have had a correspondence with him. He approached a publisher who published the Montauk Project, my publisher in Romania, who published it in the Romanian language. He approached him and says, would you like to do my book? He did. And that, that is how that book got published in, uh, in Romania. And then I... Uh, translated it? I had the books uh, translated into English and published in, in the English language. Transylvania Sunrise, Transylvania Moonrise, Mystery of Egypt, and the new one, Secret Parchment. So those right. books, all the whole series, everything that he's written is now in, in the English language. And it's a story that I also add to because each year I've gone to Romania and I add my two cents about, you know, the veracity of his claims to the degree that I can back them up. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the content of those claims. Pretty fascinating stuff. Well, the claims are that in uh, the mountains of Bucheg, spelled Bucegi, we'd say Bucegi, but they say Bucheg, and that's in uh, sort of on the border. Transylvania is a big plateau right. with the Carpathian Mountains and uh, that go around it. And on where they, the mountains meet going north and south and east and west, approximately in that area is less than 50 miles as the crow flies is where, you know, Count Dracula had his the castle, fortress. his fortress. He did not have a castle and the castle they have there is bogus. It's not his castle. It's just a tourist place with negative energy. Don't go there. It's not, he had a fortress in the mountains. You can go there, but it's, it's, it's a hard road. It's, it's, it's more obscure, but he had a fortress and that was from, people going in, crossing the mountains into Transylvania. Southern part of Romania is Wallachia, with a W, spelled with a W, Wallachia. He was the prince of Wallachia. He was not the prince of Transylvania. He did not come from Transylvania. He was uh, born there when his father was incarcerated by the Hungarians. But there was a passage there that goes in and out. Now, about 50 miles as the crow flies, it takes longer than that by car, is a Sphinx, the Romanian Sphinx, which there's other another megalith nearby. They're called Babele, which means old women. It's it's a they're both sacred stone structures. The Sphinx looks like it's uh, uh, the profile. The left side of of the face is is the face of a man. On the right side, you'll see it's faded away, eroded, but it looks like a griffin or a lion. Mm-hmm it's much more eroded than the left side and you have to get a specific view on it to see it, but it's the most biggest tourist attraction in Romania for the Romanians themselves. And it's beautiful up there. It's, it's, you're above the tree line and there's also like uh, some of my friends took a walk there. I took a hike. I went back to uh, the hotel. I'd been, I'd been having six hours of sleep for like weeks. So I went back to the hotel to rest and some of the a small contingent of our group went on a hike away from the Sphinx, and they ended up in an area where their hair began to stand on end. Weird. You know, their hair began to stand on end and, and call it static electricity. It's supposed to be just before lightning hits. I don't know if any lightning hit, but they, they had quite a time of it. 
Um, there's a lot of energetic anomalies up there, and it's it's very beautiful. But the Sphinx, and to get to the story of what you asked me, is uh, maybe it's 300 yards underneath there is, according to the story, uh, which was found with ground-penetrating radar from a satellite, was a chamber. And this chamber, they couldn't get at it. So they approached the head of Department Zero, which was the most secretive arm of Romanian intelligence, a man named Caesar Brad, and the whole story is about how he grew up under the psychic supervision of a Chinese doctor who set up the paranormal department of Romania, Department Zero. He was from Red China, and he tutored uh, basically Caesar Brad to get into this position so that he would actually help this uh, the Americans access this secret chamber because the Americans discovered it. And there's negative force that sets it up as Italian Freemasonry who tries to get at it. This character, Signor Mazzini, who tries to get at it and he's pers- portrayed as personified evil. And he's not successful in getting at the control of this chamber. The, the chamber is controlled by the Americans and the Romanians in a joint activity. Now, what's in this chamber is very sci-fi. If there's tables in there, which if you put your hand over a part of the table, it'll read out your DNA in molecular form. If you put it closer, it's an atomic form. And if you put your hand on another part of a table, it will show an alien DNA. And it will show it in microscopic or atomic form. It will also show the star system it came from. And this is all holography. So you'll see the star system, you'll see the planet, and it'll tell you that it came from there. Uh, Apparently not, I don't know if it's in the Romanian language or the English language, I don't think language is involved, I think it's graphically portrayed. Mm -hmm. And if you put them over at the same time, it'll read out a hybridization of those two species. Now this is, this is mind blowing stuff. It's mind blowing, but it see, it takes the, the myth of Noah's Ark and it says, well, what's really going on? Noah's Ark is a watered down story. Of something like this and this is supposed to be 50,000 years old to the best of their best educated guess this place is 50,000 years old man I would I would suggest I would think it would be much older that's kind of crazy well that's their educated guess they don't really know yeah Uh, who who is there any indication of who built that or how it came to be there that's a very sensitive subject when they get in in, and they get into the story and they try and find out who built it uh you know with with basically because there's also a time uh, what do you call it, uh, history of the world in holographic form there. I think there's a time device in there. They haven't really described it, but they do go, there's three tunnels in there, one of which goes to Egypt, and underneath the Giza Plateau they find a device which enables you to travel in time with your consciousness, not with your physical body. And when they get to that subject of who invented this stuff, it gets very touchy. Uh, it's like a book or a movie they've done in sci-fi called River World. When you get to the masters of the world, they become shadowy, and they don't want you to know any more than the guy who's running the haunted house that you're in, you know, when you're a kid, wants you to know what the tricks are. You know, right. he's, you know he's, he's playing games. You know, you're not, you're not getting to see behind the scenes. There's an orchestration going on there that was hard to penetrate with regard to who built it. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the, the content of this chamber. I mean, it's for people who haven't heard it, that the idea that there's a... a piece of equipment there that will holographically show you DNA of yourself, hybrids with other species. I mean, that's pretty fascinating stuff. Is there any other details about that you can give us? Was any, uh, was there any, anything extrapolated from seeing non-human DNA? I have to tell you that, uh, that book, which the incident happens in 2003, that book was written from a point about six weeks after the opening of the chamber. So that's about all the information we're offered is about six weeks of, of intense uh, investigation, which was relayed what the author was allowed to relay into the book because he has a censor. And th- so he didn't tell us too much. Most of the book is about the political infighting and manipulation into the into the background of Caesar Brad, who's the one who opens up the chamber. He allows Redu Cinemar to come in. He hand selects him to to write this story. And people in Romania will sometimes have very heated opinions of whether this uh whether this chamber exists in this reality 
or in another reality. But their their opinions are always too heated for my liking. In other words, they may be right or they may be wrong, but I don't think their he- opinions should be so heated. I, I don't have a heated opinion about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is the second book, Transylvania Moonrise, gives a lot of corroborative information in terms of newspaper articles and people that wrote into the editor uh, corroborating what had happened. We don't know exactly, but the exact DNA applications, I'm kind of zeroing in. This happened at Atlanticron this summer, and I want to get more information. Uh, I believe some of the most important things that might be gleaned from that chamber, if I don't think they've done it, is the 24th gene pair, the so-called 24th gene pair, which human beings had 20, have 23 gene pairs. Right. According to uh, sound biological theory, it's, there was once 24. And it's my hypothesis that when that separ- when when they fused, that it lessened the ability of mankind. And if we want to take it one step further, the ability to change morphogenesis, in other words, change, shapeshift. Now, there was a doctor, actually, he invited me to come out at this campfire at two o'clock in the morning. It's a huh. very momentous, this just this summer, and he's, and so they, they were, they just invited me to come out and because I was there, they were going to speak in English. Normally, they'd speak in Romanian, and it was dark. There was no campfire. They said, well, we couldn't get the wood. So we're like out there, and they say, well, we're going to talk about the ascension of the human being, a transcendence of the human being. And so I said, well, I started telling them about book two, the Transylvanian Moonrise, which goes into the longevity of living for hundreds or thousands of years. And out of that, this doctor... He's a medical doctor. He teaches medical doctors. Took a very he came to my qigong class. He took a very strong interest in this twenty fourth gene pair, uh, and then he because he understood the science of it. And then we found this young girl in, who was studying biology. She's studying biology. She's just like I think she's just starting college. And I started telling her about the tree of life and DNA, and she got interested. And then she kind of had this real scientific sort of solution that impressed the doctor. So we're going to try and get, I'm not going to go into the biology of it now because I want him to explain it to me in concise language. So Mm -hmm. I don't have to go in and he'll understand it more clearly. And it's basically, there is a scientific plausibility, but between what we're saying here to go into the deeper science of it. uh, And I said, you know, once we do this, we got to be careful that, uh, you know, maybe that we're announcing a discovery because somebody might, else might have discovered it. You know, it's like these things happen simultaneously as consciousness moves forward. But the point I was sure. saying about about uh, this is very DNA driven, and it's uh, what it's it's the morphogenesis of life. It's changing, so life is changing. We see life. We don't have the same diseases we had in the fifties. Uh, that's not all because of vaccinations, it's just life changes, diseases change, life is, is constantly changing. So what could be come out of this DNA? If I was going into that DNA bank and had access to it, I'd start asking these questions. And uh, I'd certainly like to have somebody who's more uh, versed in biological terms than I am to be with me to, like this doctor, yeah. to everything, uh, who gets it. You know, it's like people, a lot of their, their scientists don't have the prejudice that Many of our scientists were, are still suffer from, you know. This, so what they've done with it to answer your original question, I don't know. A part of me thinks that it, uh, some of the best part has gone into neglect, but I don't know that. Oh, that'd be a shame. I don't know that. Yeah. I'm saying is you see, or it's been sequestrated and only in secret sectors. Uh, what's? But it's this is the infinite potential of life itself and the human mind. Mm-hmm. So even the, the, the idea of this concept is, is something that we look forward to, just as when they did the rocket to the moon. Uh, that was a dream when I was a kid uh, in the 1950s growing up. In 1969, we had a man on the moon. The problem with the moon uh, and, and the... Uh, the space program, it's all under censorship and what goes on out there, they don't tell us everything. So right. it's all, it's all, again, it's censorship, which David Anderson has said is the key 
component in modern warfare is, it is. censorship. Yes, it is. That's I mean that's kind of why you hear all kinds of stories. The deeper you get into conspiracy, you just hear wild, wild stories, and you have to say, well, number one, I know the government lies to me. I know the government shrouds everything in secrecy. They have nefarious deeds. They have nefarious motivations. That opens the door to all kinds of wild stories, and some are true, some aren't. It's impossible to really know because no one's going to tell you the truth. The government is not going to give you any information on it. Um, right. And, and, so, right. And, and so this becomes the hallmark of the individual is that he has to go in and find his own answers. If, if you go looking to the government for answers, um, it's like going to a, you know, it's, it's like going to a teacher for an answer about something where they've just been taught to teach you pedestrian information. Uh, exactly. They're, they're, they're there to control and handle the population, not necessarily to uh, benefit the individual on these levels. So you have to go in and ask your, you have to learn how to ask yourself questions and get your own answers, um, as opposed even by getting the answers from books. Books will help you and you can decide whether you like the information or not. It's, it's that you just can't take mm -hmm. answers from a book without inspecting it yourself. Of course. And something else I did want to ask you about is, you know, you had mentioned briefly that another part of that chamber is an area that gives you the content of the history of the world. And I've heard you describe before that it comes from an individual's perspective. But, that's, I mean, is there anything, any more details about that you can give the people? Because that's pretty it's interesting, a, too. It's a bioresonant. In other words, all the devices that are described in these books are bioresonant. So if you sit in the chair to see the history of the world, it'll be different than what I see. It'll be different than uh, what the girl down the street sees. Uh, it'll be different than our parents would see if they were there. Everybody has a different perspective. So it's bioresonant. Now, this is very much akin to a hallucinogenic principle. Whereas if, if you take a hallucinogenic, it's going to be a different experience than I have. If we're both geared towards history uh, and we're both in separate chairs like that clockwork orange that comes out of these type of experiments, mm -hmm. what, the experiments that were clockwork orange, the movie was based upon, the book, uh, you're going to get and we're steered towards certain areas. We're going to have certain areas of commonality. We're going to have certain areas of difference. So what hallucinogenics such as LSD which was used extensively in the early mind control experiments was is a mind amplifier it amplifies the mind it exaggerates things it builds it up it it's the same thing they were doing at Montauk where they had highly sophisticated mind amplifiers there are two different ways to a mean there are two different means to an end which is to amplify the consciousness now I do not advocate uh, psychotronic amplification of the mind. I don't advocate hallucinogenic drugs. All of these things can be done internally. They can be done internally, and you want to develop them on your own horsepower. Um, so lucid dreaming is a, is a good practice to indulge in if one wants to uh, expand their mind. Do you have any tips for that? I've, I've had people try to give them before, but uh, lucid dreaming is one thing that I've... I've had it happen at random one or two times. How can you channel that? How can you uh, induce that? There are different ways. Uh, one way is to look at the details in the environment, like look at 30 details a day. Like uh, I'm looking over a, a hole in my wall where there used to be a... Nail or something? Nail, or, yeah. And and uh, looking at where a nail is sticking out in the wall. And, and you look at 30 details in the environment per day. And the next thing you know, you'll be in your dream looking at a detail. And you say, oh, God, I'm looking at detail. Oh, I'm doing the drill. Oh, I'm awake. And once you become awake, that's one way to become awake. And, and of course, it's also a Qigong practice because if you learn Qigong, you start doing Qigong in the dream. And then when you start doing Qigong, you're, you're trying to maintain your dream state. And once you maintain the dream state, that's challenging. Uh it's it's challenging, but then once you can maintain that dream state, then you can start to explore that area of your mind. But that that's one simple way. You can also, every time you look at a clock in real life, you can say, what time is it? Is this a dream? Can I fly? 
And you look at every time you see a clock in your life, you say, what time is it? Is this a dream? Can I fly? And that can wake you right up into a lucid state. It's such an interesting concept that you know, our minds trick us into thinking something is real and we have to consciously, repetitiously ask ourselves if it is. And then one of these times we're going to look around and we will be in a dream, but it's indistinguishable from real life. It's a fascinating element. People don't explore dreams enough. It's pretty strange. Yeah, and it's, it's something you have to have a dedicated... I know uh, there are certain substances like melatonin, which are supplements that, that can help your dream state. I, I, the first melatonin I took, I hated. I didn't like it. I, it made my dreams weird. Huh. Uh, I, it, it'll help you sleep as, you know, as well. Crazy, man. I mean, it's about that time that we wrap up, but to bring this back to the beginning of the show, I mean, one thing you mentioned about that chamber in Romania is that some people are are debating whether it exists in this reality or another. And uh, I had heard that some claims that an experiment at Montauk caused our reality to split, and we've been living within a manufactured reality since then, which gets into the same thing as some leading scientists talk about, with the holographic universe and simulation theory. Um, it also talks, it also, you know, relates to the control matrix. But what are your thoughts on that? What type, what is reality? Are we with an artificial construct? Did it come out of the Montauk project? Or... You know, is all that just speculation? Well, you know, people like to put forth theories to either to try to figure stuff out or to try and impress one or the other. And if you go back into Hindu mythology, the whole world is an illusion. They call it Maya. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all illusory. And even the Tibetans talk about the uh, primordial essence of non-existence. Everything's based upon non-existence. This world we see is fallacious. Mm -hmm. So to say that Montauk is the creation of an artificial reality, well, certainly it was creating an artificial reality or superimposed reality. From within one. But yes, we're all participants in a, in a virtual reality. But the only reason reality is important is because we have to answer to it. We have exactly. to answer to it. If you don't eat, you're going to suffer. So we're, we're, we're hostage to reality uh, because if we do not take responsibility for our interactions with it, we will experience suffering. So if we don't want to suffer, we have to pay homage to reality uh, and we may not have to pay homage to a god, but we have to pay homage to reality. And one of the most elusive uh, or most challenging gods in, in Greek mythology was Kronos, or we call him Saturn. And Saturn uh, was the, he ate all his pupils because he's time. He represents Kronos, time. So, you know, he eats the pupils. So when you get to time, you're going like, well, time. We've got so much time. How much time do you have in a physical body? Now, one can go into the precept of reincarnation and say, wow, I'm going to reincarnate, so I'll learn and, and all this. But now in this paradigm, all these this literature that I've been uh, writing and publishing is telling us by the phenomena or stories encountered that maybe we don't have to stop. We don't have to die in the same way we thought we would die. This is giving us hope and helping us have a new paradigm. So it's, it's, it's life extension or the concept of life extension. The Qigong supplements that because, you know, your organs are what basically cause old age. They fail. Well, if they're getting, if you're breathing with all of your lungs, which feed the organ, each lobe of the lung feeds an organ, you're not going to die if you're breathing. Most people aren't breathing. They're breathing like with five, 10% of their lung capacity. If they're doing a lot, they're doing 10%. And this just doesn't work. So you, you can elongate your life through practical means of breathing. You can also, but there's also these alchemical principles, which are the subject of Transylvania Moonrise, which suggests an even longer capacity to live. So wow. uh, that so the artificial reality all fits into that construct, but I'm saying is because somebody says 
this is a reality, that reality. It's much more complicated than just somebody saying it that. But yes, it's all tied to an artificial reality that we're creating that we have to answer to. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, well, man, it's kind of about that time. I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this stuff with me. I mean, we've been kind of all over the place. Uh, Montauk, the Romanian Hall of Records, Qigong, Lucid Dreams, but that's the way I like it. You know, I like it to be a casual conversation. Some interesting stuff comes out that I didn't think I'd hear about. That's great. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me. The website, again, is uh, skybooksusa.com if anybody would like any of the books. Of course, man. So, and, Amazon, and, uh, Amazon and many bookstores across the country. Yeah, and uh, is there anything that the anything you want to elaborate on and that you're working on next that people should be the next ready book, for? The next book is called, uh, which will be out sometime next year, The White Bat, The Alchemy of Writing, which will, will have this story that propelled all of this happening and then where it leads which will discuss my uh, adventures in Romania this year and I, I will be also making a shorter report in the, the newsletter Montauk Pulse which is available through the website if anybody would like it I also have a blog which I don't I don't uh, I'm not too active on the blog but it does have a lot of interesting information on there and I do try to answer questions on it um, it's called um, digitalmontauk 